when we say that uh, the food acts as a comfort, a comforting influence, um, this is usually for eating disorders who are non-restrictive, let's say. So the eating disorders that include binge eating specifically. Mm -hmm. But researchers find, found something very interesting that in individuals who have anorexia nervosa, um, this reward system is the exact opposite of what a healthy individual has. Hello, good afternoon, good day, good morning, whatever is the time zone or the time that in, in your country, in your city. I'm Vasya Salandopoulou from Antiloninus, and I'm here today with a very interesting guest, somebody that I was looking forward to having an interview for a long time now. Her name is Zeynep Demirelli. She is the realistic body therapist. If you have an Instagram account, she has a, an immense Instagram account with a lot of tips about our body image, about eating disorders, and... She is a clinical psychologist. She has studied psychology at Leiden University and he, she did also her master's degree in clinical psychology in Leiden. And she is working as a therapist. She provides psychological services and therapy to adults struggling with eating disorders, food and their body image. She focuses primarily in schema, th in schema focused therapy, but also she combines techniques from different approaches according, of course, to her clients' needs when necessary. I'm so happy to have you here after this introduction, Zeynep. <laughs> Thank you very much. Hi, Masia. Thank you so much for having me. And I'm so excited already to start talking about uh, our topic today. So yeah. thank you again for inviting me and for this lovely introduction. <laughs> yeah, you're welcome. I said two little things about your skills and about your talent. I think I could have talked for hours, but we have only one hour. And I think through this interview, people will understand a lot about your expertise and your talents in helping people with eating disorders. But first of all, tell us a few words about you. I know a couple of things about you, but people who are listening or watching don't know you. So tell us a few things about you, what you do, where do you come from? Um, where is your practice and what is generally a typical day of yours? So I'm actually from Istanbul, uh, but like you said, I studied in the Netherlands and uh, now I'm located in the Netherlands, in Leiden specifically. Uh, I practice online, but yeah, I live in Leiden and uh, I'm a therapist specializing in eating disorders and like you said I usually usually use techniques from schema therapy mostly and um, on a typical day uh, mm -hmm. I usually have no sessions until noon so my date starts a bit late uh, work-wise but before that uh, I walk my dog I have a little dog and uh, we go on this uh, little walks to a near um, coffee shop to grab some coffee, get some fresh air. And uh, while I do that, I usually listen to some audiobooks uh, about relationships, not eating mm -hmm. disorders. <laughs> mm -hmm. And um, yeah, then I walk back home and start working on my Instagram posts and yeah, whatever it is I'm going to do that day and prepare for my sessions, of course. And then mm -hmm. the time for the sessions come and then I work with my clients. Yeah, 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 yeah. I like the fact that you start, you know, your easy your your day easily, huh? Like uh, mm -hmm. having a walk with your dog, grabbing some coffee, you know, getting some fresh air, cleaning clearing your head, and then start with the more demanding tasks of your day. I like I like the way you start. Yeah, it's it's very helpful to uh, for the clarification of the mind. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, 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 indeed. Uh, but how did you, you mentioned also, you're listening to podcast of uh, relationships and today we're going to do something very interesting. We're going to combine eating disorders and relationships. So that's already mind blowing. But before we go there, um, how come you chose that area of expertise how come you you said like i'm going to work only on eating disorders i'm going to work on body image how come you chose that is there a reason behind that 
Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, so as a teenager, I struggled with an eating disorder, um, actually more than one. And that is very common for eating disorders to uh, change uh, or transform into another eating disorder. Mm -hmm. And um, I was seeing uh, different therapists, um, but I never felt understood about my body image struggles specifically. And specifically, I heard many wrong sentences that even made my body image worse. Such so, as? Um, such as, um, for example, my one of my therapists gave me uh, advice about maybe I could lose weight so that I feel better about Ooh. the way I look, yeah. which was yeah. the exact opposite what I needed to hear. Exactly. Because, yeah. The whole fight was coming from I need to lose weight to feel better. And then that was kind of confirming this yeah. Uh, yeah, negative view. I can see how um, that's very counterproductive. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh. All, always with good intentions, of course. Yeah. But uh, when people uh, are not very familiar with it, these things happen so easily. Yeah. Okay, okay, okay. And um, so... Like I said, because of uh, this, I was feeling very lonely uh, and uh, there were no resources online, especially at, at those times. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar, the ProAna website, which is ProAnorexia. And on these websites, um, they people who are struggling with anorexia uh, go on there and they write blog posts and give tips on how to lose weight and etc. So you can imagine that is not a very positive uh, resource to have online. Mm -hmm. And um, in the beginning, I did not intend to work with eating disorders. But then during my master's, I said, okay, maybe I can open an Instagram account to act as a positive resource online. Yeah. And uh, I was posting daily, I am still about my recovery, what what it felt like for me. And then with the positive feedback I received from my followers, I said, okay, maybe I should work on something that I have personal experience with. Yeah. So that's yeah. how I chose to work with eating disorders. Yeah, 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 yeah. No better healer than the one who has been wounded already and they know how to heal. I mean, that's exactly what's ha what happened in your case so i i can see how this this uh, came to be your expertise because you you know it from the inside you don't know it just by reading a book mm -hmm. yeah. i yeah. think all of us uh, therapists have a side to us like that so we have something and uh, we experienced it so we want to mm -hmm. help other people but yeah. yeah with eating disorders that is exactly what happened with me yeah, 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 definitely, definitely. And you also said that in this blog where people, pro ano, where people were writing about their experience with anorexia, it was not a positive resource. Why is that? Because it was not clear to me. Why was that, that it was not positive? Um, so they were giving tips uh, on how to eat less, for example, or sometimes mm. people, uh, mm. there are also people who struggle with bloomia there or binge eating. But it's mostly about um, sharing negative tips. So sometimes people go on there and say, uh, this is how I make myself purge. So that is not a very positive resource for uh, a person who is struggling. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Not very motivating, not very, very positive. No, okay. No. So you mentioned some terms such as bulimia, anorexia, binge eating. Would you mind to give us an introduction about this? Yes, uh, so anorexia um, is when individuals struggle to stay above a certain weight level and stay above a normal, um, stay lower than the normal weight range. And um, they, they usually restrict their food intake very severely. And of course, they are very preoccupied with the way they look, uh, with what they're going to eat, and also exercise. And there are different types of anorexia. Uh, mm -hmm. There's a type that is only restricting, 
And there's another type that is the binge purge type. So in that type, people uh, restrict for a really long time and then they have binge episodes. So they binge on food, which is um, experiencing the loss of control around food and um, yeah, just eating Mm -hmm. and kind of dissociating even while eating. Mm -hmm. And then they try to compensate by purging, uh, which can be vomiting or using Mm -hmm. laxatives or Mm -hmm. over-exercising. So exercising for three hours, for example. Yeah, 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 yeah. So Mm -hmm. um, that is anorexia. And Mm -hmm. the main thing about anorexia is that, yeah, people cannot stay above a certain weight. So they are very, uh, they have a very low weight and Mm -hmm. BMI, which is body mass index which is calculated by um, uh, your height and your weight. And you do some formulas there. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, when they are very skinny, let's say. Yeah, yeah. And then we have Blumia. And the difference there is that Blumic individuals um, may and usually restrict, um, but they are usually at a normal weight range. So not very low uh, they can also be at a higher weight which is common but usually they're at a normal weight yeah and uh, they restrict they have periods where they um, i don't know go on diets they cut out carbs uh, they don't eat and then comes a moment where they cannot do it anymore so they binge yeah and then uh, what they do is they try to compensate by purging vomiting using laxatives exercising yeah Mm -hmm. okay and this is like a cycle yeah so binge purge cycle yeah yeah i can see i can see and there are other people that they can have only binge eating for example they can do that only Yeah. yeah yes so um people who only struggle with binge eating Mm-hmm. They have binge eating disorder, uh, of course, if it's on a level that is very uncomfortable for them and yeah. if it disrupts their daily life. And it, the difference between binge eating disorder and bulimia is that people who struggle with binge eating disorder engage in no compensatory behaviors. So they don't overexercise, they don't yeah. purge, none of that happens, they just binge. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. You mentioned the element of control there. So what I want to ask you is, and it's one of the questions that I wanted to ask you, how come we connected eating disorders with mental health? What is the connection? I I can see a little bit of that while you're mentioning the control uh, issue and how we can be very preoccupied about our consumption, food consumption, or our body image. But I want to hear also your perspective. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah, people uh, who struggle with an eating disorder or simply their body image Mm -hmm. have an increased risk uh, for poor mental health, of course, and even psychiatric disorders. So there's very high comorbidity, which is uh, having more than like one, two uh, disorders at the same time and eating disorders are usually uh, connected with depression so mood disorders um, anxiety disorders such as social anxiety obsessive compulsive disorder Mm -hmm. they're also related to trauma post-traumatic stress disorder uh, substance abuse Mm -hmm. and suicidality uh, which is very high in eating disorders and personality disorders so it can be borderline personality disorder obsessive Mm -hmm. compulsive personality disorder and um, self-harm so so non-suicidal self-injury is very common in eating disorders as well so it has a very poor outcome on our mental health yeah 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 yeah. absolutely it takes a lot of our mental energy right we're thinking about food we're thinking about ourselves our body we're also thinking and and of course correct me if i'm wrong about how we are being per- perceived by others huh? like mm-hmm. people like me if i'm thin people like me if i eat less if i eat more people 
people like me if uh, there's a conditional uh, love and the condition like uh, acceptance there. So being preoccupied with all these thoughts, negative scenarios, rumination, I can see how it can affect in the long run our mental health. Yeah, 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 exactly. And that is exactly how it relates to romantic relationships as well, because um, it's very difficult to be yourself and to simply have energy to be in a relationship or to spend time with someone else other than yourself. When you are constantly thinking about what you're going to eat, how you look, how the other people see you from the outside. So it's very difficult. Like you said, uh, you spend a lot of energy, yeah, uh, yeah. precious yeah. energy on uh, how you look and weight and food, calories. Yeah, 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 yeah. And and you're missing the moment. You're missing missing the present moment. You're not there. You're not connecting with you with your partner when you are overthinking all these. Like uh, I get how somebody will be very occupied with these thoughts, um, and the need that they would like to meet is connection. So I, if I am thin or if I am, uh, if I have a nice body, uh, my partner will like me more. So we will be more connected. So I can see how they want connection and acceptance. But they are so preoccupied with that. So they miss the moment and they actually sabotage the meeting of this need because they're not there in order to connect. They are somewhere else. They're thinking, they're traveling, they are worrying about all these things. They're doubting about themselves. So I can see the self-sabotaging that happens there. Yeah, exactly. And it, of course, creates a huge wall between two parties when you have uh, an eating disorder because of the, uh, the mental energy that goes to losing weight or the way you look and of course in the beginning usually people are very ashamed um, mm -hmm. about sharing what they're going through with their partner because they feel like they might be judged the other person might think that what is wrong with this person yeah. so they go on uh, they experience these ups and downs this uh, exhausting thing not being able to share uh, anything with their partner of course creating a huge wall between the two of them like you said preventing to form a connection between yeah. the two yeah. yeah yeah if we could form like um, a timeline of a person in a relationship from the beginning until you know the growth of the relationship a person that experiences that has an emotion an eating disorder how they um, connect, how they show up as themselves, how they share about their eating disorders. Is it the same or it changes? Um, I think it changes, but there are some common things that um, people experience. Uh, I hear it from my clients or people on my Instagram a lot. But uh, if we look at the timeline of the relationship, so... Yeah. Let's say, let's start with the meeting each other, getting to know each other. Mm. So they want to go on dates to, yeah, see if they like each other, mm -hmm. which um, is very difficult for people who are struggling with eating disorders. So the challenge starts right from the beginning Ooh. because um, they want to um, make sure that the other person likes them both physically but also uh, character-wise. Yeah. So the main concern there is what do I look like from the outside and what kind of person they think I am. And um, usually uh, because of the culture that we live in currently, uh, the dates are we go out on a dinner or lunch date, right? So they're formed around food usually. Or yeah. even if you go to the movies, you grab some popcorn, etc. So uh, dates always come with the with food. So you have to eat there. Yeah. And so we already is... start with the trigger. Yes, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right before they go there, they're already triggered. So already. where you yeah. start? Yeah. Ooh. It's it's very difficult, really. Um, and they don't want to seem like weird or like. Um, 
uh, not fun. So they try to hide uh, the fact that they're very anxious about food. Mm -hmm. So um, they try to be spontaneous, uh, let the other person choose, and they try to go along with it. But of course, um, because of this, they're still very worried because they cannot control what they're going to eat or where they're going to end up going. And what I hear is uh, people do uh, menu checks online. So they look up the restaurant. Okay, mm -hmm. these are the things they offer. I can eat these. I cannot eat that. So they're very prepared from the yeah. beginning to manage yeah. that anxiety. Yeah, 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 yeah. Wow. Okay. And yeah, and they're, the they're, very... they're not gonna, as you said before, in the beginning, they're not going to share anything related to the eating disorder because that's something that they feel very ashamed of and they're trying to hide it. So we start the relationship not only with the trigger, but also with the shame and hiding a part of themselves, which is very important. Right? It's a big part of, of, of them. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. So, okay. yeah, okay. they uh, start zero to one. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I like the metaphor. Yeah. Zero to one. Wow. And then is there any moment that they show up as themselves that they share? You, you let me know. Um, I think not until very later, like mm -hmm. not until the later uh, stages of the relationship, because in the beginning, uh, they're usually just focused on um, managing how the partner sees them. So uh, they are afraid to look like they're eating too much. Mm -hmm. um, they're afraid to choose a meal that would raise some criticism and uh, for example on a date let's let's take it from the date uh, they usually wait for their partners choose um choose the meal so that they can choose the healthier alternative or the the portion the meal that has a smaller portion size because otherwise their inner critique which is the voice inside of our head that makes really harsh and mean comments mm -hmm. they say see they're gonna think you're so fat or they're gonna say no wonder you're fat you're eating so much so the inner critique is constantly there yeah, yeah. during the date which is supposed to be something fun and pleasurable light like getting to know each other it turns into a disaster for these people basically mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm going to get back into the inner critic because you said something very really important, but please continue with the timeline. <laughs> yes, I want to go back to the inner yeah. critic. As yeah, well. yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I, I guess, like, practically speaking, now that you're talking, I'm, I'm thinking different scenarios. I even guess, and you let me know whether this is true or, 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 or not, that maybe these people would even postpone or delay the moving in together. Like they are good in a relationship, but they would delay it because if we move in together, then you're going to see me purging or you're going to see me how much I eat or you're going to see me binge eating, which is something that I have been hiding very thoroughly and very well so far since we don't live together. But what if when we live together, we, you see the real me, you see somebody else that you haven't seen so far. So I guess, I guess that somebody would actually delay this the next step yes yes i agree i think uh, they would definitely delay it mm -hmm. because uh, it will be like you said very difficult to hide uh, your eating habits or unhealthy behaviors such as binging or purging yeah. right yeah. and when you live with someone that's inevitable they're gonna they're gonna see you for who you are like 100 yeah. percent or what yeah. you do yeah so um I think, yeah, they would definitely postpone mm. that. And mm. usually the partner who has the eating disorder coordinates, organizes everything around food and sometimes exercise, which disrupts the plans the couple can make together or the household works they would do. So it's very, uh, eating disorders really disrupt your daily life, like on a significant level. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can, I can definitely see that. It's, it's, it's not something minor. No, not really. Mm -mm. Okay. Yeah. And what about, 
what about when they fight? When a couple fights, <laughs> does this play a role in fighting more, for example? Um, I think it does because yeah. first of all, uh, the person who's struggling with an eating disorder will not be mentally stable because they will have uh, mood swings, ups and downs based on how they perceive themselves, how they perceive their body, uh, what they have eaten, what they haven't eaten, if they have exercise, if they haven't exercise. So there's a co completely different variable that comes into the uh, situation here. Yeah. And uh, even if that part wasn't there, uh, one of the main things I see in eating disorders is that it really distorts the perception of reality. Yeah. So um, because they see the world through the lenses of the eating disorder, everything becomes about their weight, uh, the way they look. So, for example, something I hear very often uh, is that when people fight, they say, if I was skinny enough or if mm -hmm. I was muscular enough, if I was X mm -hmm. enough, Mm -hmm. uh, then we wouldn't be fighting. We would have the perfect relationship. So uh -huh. they have this interesting reasoning uh, because of the lens of that eating yeah. disorder. So yeah. everything is about weight. And um, they think if their partner is acting distant, they say, oh, it's because I gained weight and they don't find me uh, beautiful anymore. Or let's say the partner doesn't want to be intimate at that moment. They say, oh, because I look this way or my belly roll shows, so yeah. they don't find me attractive anymore. So everything becomes about weight, food, and how you look, basically. Yeah, yeah. And even things that are very normal in relationships, like, uh, you know, fighting or not wanting to be intimate. You know, you know we are not in the mood all the time. Um, or uh, not wanting to be 24-7 together with your partner. It's, it's very normal. It's very realistic. Even these normal behaviors or reactions, they are seen through a different um, perspective, perspective, through a different angle from, for a person who has an eating disorder. It's about me. It's me who's causing that. Mm. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. And intimacy? Does this change the way or the, the how they feel intimate with their partner? Um, yes, because I think um, these people don't want to be intimate uh, because um, being intimate sexually leaves the individual both literally naked, so yeah. your partner is going to see your body, yeah. and figuratively naked because you feel vulnerable so you yeah. you be vulnerable with your partner yeah. and um, in order to enjoy the sexual acts the intimacy uh, both parties need to feel relaxed and confident about themselves to enjoy that moment to be in that moment and of course uh, eating disorders really interfere with that so the individual is too self-aware to yeah. enjoy that moment of intimacy so they see uh, sexual intimacy as no longer pleasurable which of course causes less sexual intimacy yeah yeah and of course it's less pleasurable because you are all all, all the time thinking about what is my body and how my, my belly rolls looks and how I am, what my partner is thinking about my body, of course. And there's so much so much stress in there and stress is the number one libido uh, killer. Uh, so yeah. I, can, I, I can see how you can have no mood or how can you cannot enjoy that, definitely. Yeah, yeah. unfortunately, yeah. that's another thing that an uh, eating disorder disrupts yeah. in our lives. Yeah. yeah, 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 indeed. And I guess, since we're talking about relationships, we're not talking about a relationship where this person is securely attached, right? We're not talking about a safe attachment. Mm -mm. Mm. No, no. Uh -huh. um, because I think um, they are very afraid to be themselves. Mm. So um, they're usually they have an insecure attachment style, usually thinking the partner will leave them 
or they have to be a certain way for them to stay or sometimes they become avoidance as well but because they don't trust themselves uh, they don't trust the partner to uh, take care of them or to love them either so yeah i think it's very difficult to have a secure attachment with the partner when you are struggling with your body image and if you are a partner of a person with an eating disorder what is it that you can do how you can support them how you can i mean we talked about acceptance yeah? they're looking for acceptance they're looking looking for connection how you can convince them or how you can show them that you are there to accept them as they are you are there to connect with them. what is it that a partner can do for them um i have a few tips for Uh, for these partners, these caring partners. Um, First, I think it's important that um, you educate yourself on the topic. So do your own research, go online, read books, whatever you prefer. And understand the general concept. Uh, But at the same time, it's important to listen to your partner as well. So if Mm -hmm. your partner feels comfortable, ask them okay i want to understand you better i want to be there for you can you tell me how this is for you how do you feel because um even though of course we have the books research eating disorders are a very personal experience so everyone can experience it differently so by doing this uh, you will be showing your partner that you care enough to do your own research but also to ask how they feel about it yeah. and um, while listening uh, of course it's very important to validate so um, usually things that are upsetting for the partner who has an eating disorder uh, they don't make sense for the other partner so oh, um, mm-hmm. like, like an example uh, if their partner is upset about eating a burger they're complaining about oh i have eaten a burger it's too much Uh, usually the partner's reaction is oh it's just a burger don't worry about it of course that is a healthy reaction but Mm -hmm. for the other person that is their reality that's unhealthy Mm -hmm. they're obsessed with that at that moment so hearing that it's just a burger don't Mm -hmm. worry it's just one kilogram it's this it -hmm. doesn't work even though it comes with good intentions they're like oh, they don't understand me. Uh, I should never tell them again because they yeah, feel even yeah. invalidated, really. Exactly, yeah, it sounds invalidating. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. While yeah. instead, what they could have said? Um, for example, I understand that you are upset about eating that burger and uh, it must be very difficult for you right now to yeah. experience this. What can I do to help you? Or is there any way I can be there for you? Simply that. Okay. Okay. Yeah. That sounds better. Indeed. Indeed. (laughs) And um, to tie in with that, I think it's important to ask uh, the partner what they expect of them. So usually the the healthy partner uh, struggle because they listen and listen but they don't know what to do or what they can do or how Mm -hmm. to help or what the other person expects of them so what they can do is I love you and I want to support you Um, how can I help you feel better Mm -hmm. or how can I help you with this Mm -hmm. so that the healthy partner also knows uh, what is expected of them and their limitations as well. Yeah, 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 yeah. Indeed, indeed. Um, since a person with an eating disorder is putting so much attention on how they look, on what they eat, would it help if their partner focuses on other parts of them? Like, I like how funny you are, or I like how caring partner you are, I like... I like other parts of you, which is more, you know, more important, actually, eh? your personality, the fact that you are such a nice person, such a kind person, the fact that you make me feel loved. If you if they focus on other elements of their personality rather than on their body, would that help? I think it would. And it Mm -hmm. does. Um, Mm -hmm. 
because like you said it takes the attention away from weight and physical appearance but says there are other things about you that are very important your weight is the least interesting thing about you and i love you enough surprisingly enough for them <laughs> yes for them yes it may come as a shock to you but i am not interested about you in your body i'm interested in all the rest exactly they usually don't believe that by the way even though they're told that 100 times but it's important to say that as a partner because it's it's helpful just to hear it yeah 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 mm -hmm. yeah, yeah yeah indeed indeed all right so, uh, for those listening and watching, I don't want you to miss this opportunity to connect with Zeyna because she's sharing so useful tips and advice and insights in regards to body image, accepting our body, loving our body again, taking our mind off the food all the time. Eh? Either you have an eating disorder or not, I follow her, so I, I learn a lot from her. So have a look at your Instagram account, which is um, a fantastic resource, realistic.body.therapist. And you're going to learn a lot from Zainab. Now, Zainab, if I have your permission, can we go a little bit deeper? <laughs> yes. yes, let's go. <laughs> let's go. Let's go. <laughs> let's put our hats and, you know, like our mind hats and the goggles and let's get prepared. <laughs> Um, how did this all start? I mean, it's not about food. It's something else. Mm -hmm. And it's something, as you say, it can start very early in our lives. You had experienced eating disorders from your teenage years, as you say. I also know people that they have experienced that way earlier than that. What are the triggers? What is the onset of an eating disorder? What is that plays an immense role in starting seeing ourselves through this different, distorted, as you said before, uh, lens? Mm -hmm. um, first of all, culture, very okay. important. Uh, mm -hmm. Maybe not the main component, but still uh, the diet culture. So the constant talk about uh, how we should lose weight, the new diets that keep coming or the diet culture language that is very embedded in our daily language. So, oh, I gained so much weight, let's go on a diet. Oh, summer is coming, we should lose weight. So as a child, when you grow up hearing these, um, you internalize those messages. Then mm -hmm. I should be uh, skinny. Uh, then how... I feel is less important than how I look. So these messages uh, on the background play a huge role, I think. But of course, everything starts with the parents and your relationship with your parents and um, yeah, attachment, basically. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 Um, so we have emotional needs that need to be met as a child uh, our favorite topic to talk about <laughs> with you <laughs> yeah 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 <laughs> and uh, when these needs are not met by the caregiver so these needs can be acceptance uh, stability secure attachment uh, attention safety uh, when these needs are not met uh, we fail to form a secure attachment or to bond safely and usually, um, at some point in their life, the, the child learns that uh, they can soothe themselves when they feel that uh, unmet need. So they use it as a way to detach from the situation where they feel like they're not loved, they're not accepted, they're not cared for. And um, they do this by eating usually um, and then during that eating phase of course uh, there's a physiological side to it as well so we know that eating triggers the brain's reward system and uh, when we eat our body uh, releases endogenous opioids which is internally produced painkillers basically and 
endogenous opioids help our brain uh, and body control pain. So let's say you are feeling not loved, defective as a kid. So you find some kind of painkiller, which ends up being the food, and you realize unconsciously that mm. when I'm feeling uncomfortable, if I reach for the chocolate, oh, suddenly it's not that important anymore. Yeah. So you learn that as a kid that um, with food, you can soothe yourself when your needs are not met, basically. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah my mind goes also very earlier than this chocolate moment <laughs> mm -hmm. when we as babies cry the first thing that our mothers do is feed us mm -hmm. so wow. we make a connection already as babies like i'm crying i'm feeling you know in distress something hurts or i'm cold or i don't know why i'm crying for any reason but the first thing that our mothers do okay have some milk mm -hmm. Ooh feel better now <laughs> wow i never thought of this it's yeah. very interesting yeah 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 i mean it's the same example you said but i was thinking like as babies we do the same we learn that uh we soothe ourselves and we feel better or we learn that food serves as a as a painkiller either emotional or physical painkiller exactly exactly yeah 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 <laughs> So that's why we use it then. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> yeah, 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 indeed, indeed. But I like the theory, you know, about this endogenous opioid that helps, you know, the, the hormones that they released. And it makes sense because all of us experience that. It's not like only people who have eating disorders. All of us, when we... we when we drink a cup of tea, for example, when we eat some chocolate, when we come back from work and we are exhausted and we have some comfort food, as we call it, mm -hmm. it, it works. For all of us, we feel, ah, oh, I'm so much better now. Oh, I used to be grumpy an hour ago, but now I'm feeling better. So it works for all of us, but there's something that um, makes it, let's say, more more exaggerated reaction for people with a more re exaggerated or a more strong connection for people with eating disorders. Yeah, yeah, indeed. Um, and something very interesting just came to my mind. Um, hmm. So when we say that uh, the food acts as a comfort, a comforting influence, um, this is usually for eating disorders who are non-restrictive let's say so the eating disorders that include binge eating specifically mm -hmm. but researchers find found something very interesting that in individuals who have anorexia nervosa um, this reward system is the exact opposite of what a healthy individual has so um, like we said when we eat the uh, opioids are released and we feel rewarded we feel better and what they found was in individuals with anorexia they had the same effect with not eating so the more they fasted the less they ate mm -hmm. uh, the more rewarded they felt so they don't know how this uh, reverse uh, effect happened but this is something very interesting to me because mm -hmm. um when when you really think about it or when uh, someone when you compare someone who has bulimia or binge eating to someone who has anorexia they usually say i cannot not eat that much like it's impossible to go that way but what they found was they have a completely different physiological reaction yeah compared yeah. to the other people and does it mean that they view eating as a punishment if they yes. if they view not eating as a reward do they view eating as a punishment i i think yes okay, okay. um i don't know if the research mm -hmm. confirms that but mm -hmm. when you talk to people who struggle with anorexia they say that eating is a form of punishment so wow. it's really bad they feel really bad and sometimes they eat to punish themselves when they feel bad about themselves as well oh yeah oh yeah mm -hmm. oh yeah oh yeah 
Um, is there any research that shows uh, any connection, any relation between eating disorders and relationship with mother? Um, there are probably. I cannot okay. say anything specific, uh, yeah. but um, there is probably because the treatment for eating disorders, especially with adolescents, it's family treatment. Yeah, that's that is known. So they always yeah. treat it with the family, including the parents, basically, mm -hmm. and fixing their relationship and their attachment together. So there is hundred percent a link <laughs> there, mm -hmm. but I cannot say this is what the research says. Yeah, 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 yeah. Indeed, indeed. I'm just uh, connecting the dots. Eh? What we have said so far, we talked about. Uh, emotional needs being met by our main caregivers, which is usually our parents. Uh, I am connecting also the element of control. I'm connecting also the element of inner critic. When you have inner critic, a very strong inner critic, is usually because somebody else from your environment was judging you, was criticizing you, going back into the family. Um, and then one way to work with this inner critic can be control. I'm going to control myself so that I can be perfect or that I can be eventually somebody accepted and loved as I am. Um, so what are usually the messages of inner critic that we hear if we have an eating disorder? So very negative and mean yeah. messages yeah. about weight. Yeah. So no matter what the individual does the weight is never good enough their body is never good enough they always have to try harder they have to do something more or they have to be perfect not good good is not enough so they have to be perfect perfect and perfect. um like you said they should be able to control themselves for example around food or uh, they see it as a way uh, to how do you say that they see it as a noble thing to not yeah. eat or yeah, to eat yeah. less or to more sometimes uh, women say more ladylike so if you don't eat as much you're more like um, small framed and thin then it's more ladylike more attractive yeah. so yeah. the inner critique uh, is constantly there like you said critiquing everything body what they eat how they think even uh, sometimes what i hear is the inner critic gets upset just by the thought of the food so they say how can you even think about eating now so it's it's wow. very strong wow. and constantly there yeah 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. Since we talked before about relationships, if somebody with such a strong inner critic and the need for control is in a relationship, do you also see externalizing that inner critic and control need? Do you see, for example, them trying to control their par partners, them being very critical and very judgmental towards their partners? Do you see that as well? Yes, indeed. When uh, the inner critic is very strong, of course, it's, I think, very difficult to not externalize it because that becomes what you believe in, like, strongly. Yeah. So yeah. the inner critic is always right, and there's a specific way to live life, to look. So, of course, it is internalized to the partner, um, not in the way of, I think, food or physical appearance. Yeah. Sometimes maybe they can criticize uh, their partner's weight but I don't think it's very common because then people usually get into some kind of empathetic mode and say wait it doesn't feel good for me it probably won't feel good for them so not in the topic of eating or their weight but usually how their partner react or the way they do something yeah 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 yeah, yeah I can see that um, yeah they can be very judgmental about other elements of their life like their work their you know like confidence or their family or anything else eh? so that yeah. they can kind of bring a balance into their into their life like if i am uh in a way judged 
because I judge myself, then if I judge you, we are kind of similar. Like we are both having something that it's deserving to be judged. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Soothing a little bit this inner critic when we are externalizing it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, what was my other question? Ah, yeah. What are the questions that you usually hear about food or body image from your um, Instagram account? Is there something that pops into your mind like, oh, this is something that I hear very often? Um, usually people ask about uh, how they can help their uh, partners or sometimes uh, mm. uh, parents reach out to me and ask, how can I help my kid? Oh, that's um, nice yeah yeah it it makes you believe in humanity <laughs> yeah yeah restores your faith in humanity definitely <laughs> yeah um so that is asked very oftenly and um people usually ask about the um, psychology behind um for example bad body image days or mm. um their relationship with their parents and the messages they took from them so people love to hear about that because it helps them, I think, give meaning to what happened and to explain, okay, when I have a bad body image, this is what's happening inside of me. So now I know. It's not yeah. like a black box that I have no clue about. Now I know. Or yeah. with parents, oh, that's why. When my mom said that, mm. that's how I took it. So yeah. these are the questions that are usually asked on my Instagram okay 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 yeah it makes sense but I, I i'm really surprised and i really like what you said uh, partners or parents they're looking for advice on how they can help their children or their partners that's that's good news thank you thank you for yeah. that <laughs> <laughs> you you said about body image that's one of the last things that we're going to discuss and i've heard about body positivity and body neutrality what it is that each one of these let's say uh perspectives stand mm -hmm. for so body positivity is um liking your body uh, unconditionally at all times and um ideologically the point of focus remains the physical appearance so i look good today so it's kind of expected that when you look in the mirror you say oh my God, I love my body. I love the way, I don't know, my belly looks, my leg. So that is what is expected when they uh, say body positivity. I'm sure it didn't start like that. I think it started more as uh, body neutrality, but with time, I think it progressed into body uh, positive toxic something. Yeah. yeah. So um, body neutrality, as a contrast is just accepting your body the way it is and mm. appreciating its abilities and treating it with respect even mm -hmm. if you don't like it at that moment so yeah. what it says that you don't have to like your body all the time but it's important that you recognize what it does for you and you treat it with respect basically so yeah. i would always say body neutrality over body positivity because yeah. it's very unrealistic to expect to love our bodies constantly uh, and it's like jumping from one extreme to another so when you're struggling with an eating disorder you hate your body let's say you're on the extreme side and if you try to practice body positivity how am I going to jump from hating my body to adoring it so it's very difficult and yeah, unachievable in my opinion. Yeah. So just saying, okay, this is my body today. I don't feel good about it, but that's fine. It's still working for me. I can still walk around. I can still cook food. I can still hug people. So that mm -hmm. is what body neutrality is. Yeah. And it, I, it sounds healthier to me. Because when I hear the body positivity, I feel the pressure. I have to like my body. I have to love my body. I have to like even the parts that I don't like. So I feel pressure. I have to. I have to. While in the body neutrality, is like, okay, you don't need to love it. You don't need to hate it. It's a vessel that carries your important organs and, you know, like a heart and stomach and, you know, like muscles and bones. 
that's that's it it's a vessel but uh that's it if if it works it works <laughs> that's it that's exactly <laughs> stay healthy it works and that's what we need if it's five kilos more or five kilos less it's fine as long as it works exactly yeah 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 all right then if somebody would like to learn how to be friends with our body if they have been enemies with their body for a long time, what would you suggest? Okay, so the first thing I would suggest, easier said than done, but uh, <laughs> to understand that your body is capable of handling food. So I'm just talking for the ordinary person, of course, uh, not a person who has some illness, no, but the general public. Yeah. Our bodies are well capable of handling food uh so it's important that we trust its abilities so whenever um so like going to the bathroom your body tells you i need to go to the bathroom now so you go with mm -hmm. food it's similar if if we actually let our bodies be and do its thing magic mm -hmm. uh, then it's gonna tell us today i'm craving this give me some fresh food yeah. today i just want a huge burger with uh, fatty meat on it so give me that so yeah. it's important that we trust its abilities and its judgment that uh, it's going to take care of itself and it's able and capable basically yeah and um that is a more mental tip let's say a more physical tip would be wear clothes that fits you so don't try to fit in clothes but mm. wear clothes clothes that fit you basically yeah otherwise it gets very complicated the inner critique starts talking and then it's all downhill from there yeah, yeah. that's what i do i try to fit in my old clothes <laughs> i think everyone does <laughs> at some point it's but I, I see the pressure. I'm like, oh, oh, I have to feed. I have to feed, and then I get confused and I get upset with myself. But then, you know, at some point, I'm like, okay, I need to buy some new clothes. <laughs> exactly, uh, but it's a very cultural thing, I think, because uh, it's it's like a big achievement when you say, oh, I can fit into my high school prom dress. It's very weird, but it's a thing. Yeah, <laughs> so it's yeah. not only you, Vasya. I think it's yeah. everyone. Yeah, and yeah. it's important to realize what kind of uh, effect it has on our mental health. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I like what you said, like, we are rewarded. It's a cultural thing. It's it's in our families even. And I, I, I noticed something that I haven't noticed before, how much my family is talking by, about, about body, about weight, about everything. And I haven't noticed that before, like... Not in a negative way, but, you know, like, oh, you have eaten a lot. I can see your belly. Not in a negative way, but still somebody saying something about your body or about their body. Oh, I cannot do any more food. I'm so full and I've gained weight and I need to lose it. Just as a, the, the normal everyday talk, somebody will always talk about food or body image or body. Yeah. Yeah. And, we have and we're so used to it. Normal. Yeah yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I had to remind my mother because now I have a, I have a niece and uh, I have to remind my mother, don't say anything about your body. Don't say anything about how your belly or your legs or your eyes or your hair. Don't say anything. We don't need to comment on that, neither good or bad, because also the positive comments can be seen as uh, a conditional acceptance like oh wow you've lost weight fantastic you look gorgeous that can also be something conditional like i like you or i see you when you have lost weight yeah exactly that is that is also very common so people are very confused when i say don't compliment weight loss no because uh it sounds like a compliment uh, but like you said it gives the message that oh, I'm seen and I'm yeah. cared for and I'm accepted yeah. or yeah. simply recognized yeah. when I lose weight. Exactly, exactly. And what will people think if this changes then? <laughs> exactly, yeah, yeah. yeah. So exactly. you are a very um, nice uh, and 
lovely aunt let's say <laughs> <laughs> yeah i try i try it's only because i hear and i read a lot about this and i understand how this pressure has been following me as well eh? as, a, as a woman uh, throughout my life this pressure about my body and i can be more self-conscious sometimes and be more aware about my body but i also see how this is not healthy and we don't need that yeah so last but not least what are the three things that somebody needs to take from this conversation today as a takeaway message something that they could implement something that they need to take with them because we've said so many useful things um so first thing would be like a little summary so eating disorders have a large influence on our romantic relationships and it makes it difficult to go on dates to open up to be intimate and it really distorts the individual's perception of reality of themselves and of the other person so it's important to understand how serious that is when uh, someone struggles with that and the extent that they go to because of their eating disorder. And um, as a partner, you can support them in many ways, listening, validating, loving unconditionally. But of course, the best thing you can do as a partner is to guide them towards getting professional help because in the end, there are mental illnesses and they require professional help. Yeah. And um, the last thing, a takeaway um, tip would be, don't let your inner critique get the best of you. Yes, yes, mm -hmm. yes. The inner critic doesn't belong here, out. <laughs> exactly. Out. Find a way to decrease its vo voice or something. Yeah, it takes away all our chances for connection, for joy, for love, for acceptance, for validation, for, for fun. All the nice things in life, <laughs> they're taken away just because we're listening to this inner critic so much. Exactly. I have a tip for people who try to uh, push away their inner critic. Bring it so on. What they can do is try to uh, give it a name, to externalize it, to separate it from yourself. And let's say Sarah, I don't know, let's say mine is Sarah. And you say, oh, Sarah is acting up again. So when that <laughs> voice comes up and says these critical things about you, say, oh, she's acting up again, not again. And um, another funny thing they could do is, um, Imagine the voice to be in the Mickey Mouse's voice. So it's very hard to take it seriously after mm. a minute of imagining it that way. It helps um, uh, externalize it even more. Ah, that's a nice one. I could use, I could do mine in the Donald Duck voice. <laughs> yeah, that works as well. Whatever that works right. for you. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can see the ridiculousness of this voice. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Indeed, indeed. All right. So let's create some distance from our inner critic by naming that part of us, by giving it a name that is quite distinguishing, that it's like it's Sarah or it's the, um, uh, the rotten apple or whatever it is, an <laughs> apple, a, a name that we can give. And in order to create distance, that this is not me thinking like that, it's my inner critic. There's a healthy part in me that thinks in a different way, but my inner critic is thinking in a very unhealthy way. So it's them thinking like that, creating this distance and also imagining it in a cartoon voice. Fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Thank you so much for giving us the opportunity to learn from you learn something i mean i i don't think that what you discussed today with me was only about eating people with eating disorders this applies to everybody and how we view our bodies how we talk about our bodies how we feel accepted by other people how we let our inner critics get in the way of healthy relationships but so thank you so much for sharing your wisdom and your expertise 
Thank you for having me and this lovely uh, enriching conversation that we had about the topic. It was really nice. Yes, I had fun as well. For those listening, you can see the realistic.body.therapist account on Instagram. You can learn many things there. Uh, If you want to work with Zeynep on um, eating disorders, body image, or um, what else we said? Eating disorders, body image. Food struggle. (laughs) Food struggles, yeah. (laughs) Food struggles, yes. You can find her at her uh, website, but also at Antilonis' site. And I'm going to add the links into the description. And see if they are ready to work with you. Yes. Thank you so much. Have a nice day. Thank you. You too. Thank you.